Defiance and fear as an East London district becomes the focus of the UK government's terror investigation. How menstrual education can keep a girl in school. And the remains of the last African dinosaur are discovered in Morocco. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Now we begin in Britain where police have now identified two of the three men who carried out Saturday's uh, terror attack close to London Bridge which killed seven people. 27-year-old Quran Shahzad Bhatt and 30-year-old Rashid Radun both lived in the East London district of Barking. There is shock among local residents and growing concern that extremists were able to operate undetected by intelligence services and the local Muslim community. Henry Ridgewell visited the London neighborhood and has our report. The eastern suburb of Barking epitomizes multicultural London, but the area has been rocked by revelations that Saturday's terror attack was carried out by men from this community. One of the attackers, 27-year-old Kuram Shazad Bhatt, lived in this apartment block with his wife and two young children. One resident of the same apartment block says she complained about the suspect to police two years ago after he tried to convert her son to Islam as he played with a group of friends in the local park. Local residents who knew him say Bhatt once worshipped at the nearby Jabir bin Zaid mosque but was thrown out after a confrontation with the imam. Community leaders say local mosques are united in their condemnation of the attack. You know, all the community leaders... Uh, all the mosque authorities, they were saying very strongly that you know, we will not spare anybody if somebody does this. And also here, they are concerned and they are serious, I think. And also community people are also serious because it is harming them and it is negative for them. Opposite the mosque, the British flag hangs at half-staff on the St Margaret's Church of England school. Just down the road lies the East London Sikh Gurdwara. Barking residents told VOA all faiths live together in harmony, but many here are shaken. To tell you the truth, I'm scared to go out to the station now. You can't even go in the bus now because you're scared. Muslim communities reject any link with Saturday's attack. Many fear a backlash against their faith. It's a very friendly environment, the people living here, and uh, there is no such extremism. It's unacceptable. Only the Muslims being targeted around the world, not only in the Britain. So, so they should look. The Muslims are being slaughtered around the world. So, how is that possible? Only the Muslims, they are the bad people, and the rest is the very good people. Intelligence services say the two named attackers were known, but there was no evidence an attack was imminent. Authorities are investigating whether others in the community knew of or helped conceal their extremism. Muslim leaders reject any link with the terrorists and maintain they are cooperating fully with police. Henry Richwell for VWA News, London. Now to Southern Africa, main opposition leader Thomas Tabani had won the most seats in the Soda's weekend general elections, clinching 48 of the 80 directly contested constituencies. His enemy and current prime minister, Pakalita Musisili, had won only 16 seats by last night. And the Lesotho's constitution, the leader of the party winning most seats in the 80 contested constituencies is given the first right to form the government. Now, this means that Tabane will be, will lead his uh, 48 constituents with his const uh, 48 constituent seats will forge a, a coalition with other parties to form the next government. Well, uh, for more on Lesotho's elections, journalist Billy Taota joins me by phone from Mosero. Uh, now, Billy, we gather that uh, we have all the results in. Give us the latest. Uh, what's, uh, what's a picture of things there? Billy. Billy in Taota in Mosero. Can you hear me? Oh, Okay, looks like uh, we have lost our connection there with Billy Taute in Macero. 
We move on. The U.S. Justice Department has just announced, uh, rather announced on Monday, the arrest of a government contractor it said sent classified material to an online news outlet. The announcement came the same day as a report by The Intercept saying a classified document it obtained showed Russian military intelligence tried to hack into U.S. voter registration systems before last year's elections. An affidavit, uh, affidavit uh, submitted by an FBI special agent said the woman arrested, Reality Lee Weiner, admitted to printing classified intelligence reporting and mailing it to a news outlet. The affidavit also says a U.S. intelligence community agency determined in its uh, investigation that six people had printed the document, including Weiner, and that she had email uh, contact with the unnamed news outlet. U.S. intelligence already has determined that Russia hacked into Democratic Party emails and leaked embarrassing information to WikiLeaks in an apparent effort to help Republican Donald Trump win the presidential election over Democrat Hillary Clinton. Now, Congress and a special counsel are investigating whether anyone in the Trump campaign colluded with the Russians. Well, the Iran nuclear deal, the Paris Climate Accord, the historic U.S. re-engagement with Cuba, those were all key foreign policy initiatives defining the legacy of former President Barack Obama. And they're all coming under fire from President Donald Trump. Viewers Bill Gallo reports. Donald Trump has never been afraid to criticize his predecessor's foreign policy. The fact is, we inherited a mess. It's a mess. But in reality, Trump had not actually reversed major parts of Barack Obama's foreign policy until recently. Now, from turning up the heat on Iran during his meetings with Arab leaders to pulling the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord, Trump is aggressively dismantling key parts of Obama's foreign policy legacy. There's no doubt that within this administration, you're given points if you're seen as undoing what the previous administration did. Christy Goldfuss, who worked on environmental policy in Obama's White House, sees the 2015 Paris climate deal as one of the former president's key foreign policy achievements. Although it's signed by 195 countries, the climate deal was never ratified by Congress. That makes it more vulnerable to being overturned by Obama's successor. That is also true of Obama's nuclear deal with Iran, which Trump has criticized, though not yet discarded. Another vulnerable target? Obama's policy of re-engagement with Cuba. The White House is nearing the end of a full review of Obama's Cuba policy. No one knows how wide-ranging any changes will be, but there's nothing preventing Trump from enacting a total rollback, says John Kavalik of the U.S.-Cuba Trade and Economic Council, speaking via Skype. All it takes is ink in his pen. And as we've seen, he, he likes pens, he likes nice pens, he likes to have a lot of pens. Cuba! During the campaign, Trump took a hard line on Cuba, threatening to reverse all of Obama's policies. For now, Trump appears focused on domestic issues, and a White House official tells VOA that no decision is imminent. But for many Obama alumni, the change has only just begun. I expect that we will see a lot more efforts to undo and uh, really threaten a lot of the progress that we made over the past eight years. That seems to be a priority, and there's no indication that they are slowing down or even want to stop doing that. Of course, in reversing Obama's policies, Trump himself is acting unilaterally, meaning those moves, too, can one day be reversed by his successor. Bill Gallo, VOA News, the White House. What are we going back to Lesotho, where we're connecting with uh, journalist uh, Billine Taute, uh, from the capital, Macero, to look at the results of uh, the recently concluded elections there. Billy, uh, if you can hear me, uh, just give us the latest because we hear all the results are in now. Billy. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Billy in Tauta, can you tell us what's going on? Uh, the final results are out, so who is winning? OK, looks like uh, we have a serious uh, problem there with communication. And therefore, we will go ahead and uh, 
uh, go on. Let's let's uh, let's go on a break right now, and we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. So join the conversation on uh, Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends also. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. And uh, find me on Twitter at VOA Vince and McCory. Now coming up, how addressing uh, menstrual health could keep girls in school. Stay with us. study says one in five twins born in sub-Saharan Africa dies before turning five even as infant mortality has dropped sharply for lone babies in the region. The team of British and Dutch researchers analyzed data on some 1.7 million children born in 30 sub-Saharan African countries between 1995 and 2014. That sample captured the birth of nearly 60,000 twins. The researchers say the region is home to the highest rate of natural twin birth and the trend of early death is alarming. Detecting twin pregnancies early might facilitate mothers' access to specialized health care, they suggest. To increase their chances of survival, twins also could be monitored by medical staff on a continuous basis in early life. Now, menstruation is one of the many physical signs that a girl is turning into a woman. Experts and advocates say the silence around menstruation, as well as the lack of access to sanitation facilities and hygienic absorbance in developing countries directly affect adolescent girls' self-esteem, health, and education. The United Nations Children's Fund says one in 10 African girls skip school during menstruation. Some drop out entirely because they lack access to sanitary products. 83% of girls in Burkina Faso have no place to change their sanitary menstrual materials at school. One million girls in Kenya miss up to six weeks of school each year because of their periods. Similar issues affect girls in India, Cambodia, and Iran. Joining us now via Skype from Nairobi, Kenya, for more is Angela Lagat, Chief Brand and Marketing Manager with ZANA Africa, an organization that delivers reproductive health education and sanitary pads to adolescent girls in Kenya. Angela, welcome to the show. Thank you, Leno. Great. I think we have her now we have her via Skype now. <laughs> Very well. Thank you so much for joining us, Angela. Listen, the issue of uh, menstrual hygiene is really affecting a young girl around the world, but specifically Africa. Tell us about the scope of the problem in Kenya. Well, um, I mean, um, the UN reports already say that there are approximately one in 10 schoolgirls across Africa who, go to, uh, who miss school due to menstruation. Yeah. Um, that translates to approximately four in five in East Africa, and that's two in three in Kenya. So this results uh, has an impact um, in, in terms of educational attainment for girls because they end up missing school, as well as in terms of their um, reproductive health decisions. They are uninformed about menstruation because of the silence around it. And furthermore, they lose self-esteem. It's seen as shameful. So no one talks about it. They lose their confidence and agency um, around uh, making uh, healthy decisions. So then, uh, at this point, what is being done? I know your organization, ZANA Africa, is, is addressing this issue with health education and other things. Tell us about that. So uh, ZANA Africa, our, we envision a space where um, girls and women, and girls especially, can access menstrual hygiene products and um, health education. 
Uh, and that's because we believe that um, menstruation is the opt opportune time to have conversation with girls about sexual reproductive issues and, and um, as they navigate um, puberty and adolescence. So one of the things that we work with, we develop, um, we have sanitary pads, which we make sure that they're affordable at a quality. There are many products in the market. They are very expensive. Um, but also the, um, the ones which are affordable or what we call cheap are quite, um, they, would, they don't do the work that girls need. So girls sit around worried that they, they might leak or, or stay in their dresses. So they don't concentrate in class if, if they're, they're present in school, but they don't concentrate. So we work to de develop uh, a product um, that is of quality. We also develop um, a health education content, which is focused on menstrual health. And we have Nia Teen, which is a um, very engaging referral resource called um, magazine that girls can actually read and get information about menstruation and the changes that they're in, um, facing or going through through pu puberty. Um, and this is very helpful for them to be educated around the changes that they're facing and that they can also catalyze conversations between them and their guardians and their influences and their parents around issues of menstruation. Okay, so Angela, they, uh, some observers say that uh, one of the, the issues is the culture of silence around uh, menses, around menstruations. What are your thoughts and how, obviously you, you are addressing part of it, of the work that you're doing, but what are your thoughts? I mean, is it something that, isn't it supposed to be uh, something private for the girl? At what point do we talk about it and what do we talk about? Um, I, I love that you said uh, it should be private. It shouldn't be private. Um, it should be celebrated, and it's a rite of passage. Menstruation is the first point when girls actually are starting puberty. It is the journey to womanhood. So some of the challenges that we face is because people don't talk about it. So this means that it's meant to be shameful. And this means that it's supposed to be hidden, and girls feel isolated and alienated that this is, um, this is something wrong. Boys um, in, 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 in different cultures are celebrated and they have rites of passage. Why can menstruation be the same? So we encourage at Zana Africa and through our brand Nia that actually parents and guardians should be having conversations not only with the um, adolescent, but as, as young as um, nine or 10 years old when girls become curious and, and they have friends and there is media exposure. So girls are aware that this is happening or is happening to their friends already. So they are curious. And so we want conversations to be catalyzed um, between mothers and daughters, between aunties. And this happens already in, in some African cultures where aunties okay. are the ones who are supposed to talk to daughters. Okay, of course, the conversation is very important. So yes, this needs to be discussed. Thank you so much, Angela, for joining us today. Thank you, Lino. And Angela Lagat is Chief Brand and Marketing Manager with ZANA Africa. And the, now the United Nations predicts that by 2025, nearly 2 billion people will be living in places where there is not enough water to go around. And since on average, uh, water makes up about 60% of the human body, well, not having it has a host of devastating effects that go way beyond just being thirsty. That's why some te new technology to turn salt wa salty water into drinkable water holds uh, so much promise, VOA's Kevin Enox reports. Lack of water can be as dangerous and deadly as the worst epidemic, and it's all too common. That's why this simple graphene filter holds so much promise. You take a dirty oil water mixture, and then you pass this water through this pump, pump basically pumping this water through, through this membrane. So this is a graphene oxide membrane, and then this water goes through, and then what we get is, is a clean water coming out here. University of Manchester researchers are using a graphene filter because it is strong, highly flexible, electrically conductive, and transparent. It's also one atom thick, which means it's tiny enough to filter out sodium chloride atoms. The problem was to, when you put the membrane in water, the sieve become larger. Now we solved that problem. So now we can take this uh, salty water, put it back in our new filtration unit, where we filter it, filter out even the smallest sodium chloride. Researchers say the process is quicker than current desalination technology, and if their small filter is scaled up to an industrial level, could be cheaper. But of course, currently the price is slightly higher. It's just because the consumption of the material is low. 
So in future, if you scale up this process and if you wanted to use more material, the price will definitely go down. The team is also working on making a small-scale portable filter that could ensure clean water in areas without running water. Kevin Enix, VOA News, Washington. And that's our health report for today. So stay in touch for more. Find me on Twitter at Linormudu. Back to you, Vincent. Well, and thank you very much uh, for, uh, for joining us today, Lino. Now be sure to watch for Lino Mudu every Tuesday and Thursday for the latest health news in Africa, right here on Africa 54. Well, acts of terror by foreigners in the United States are rare, but even the, in the quiet heartland of America, fear of jihadi violence, in particular from Islamic State, has taken hold. At VOA's Deepak Bohal uh, has, has, has more from Boscobel, Wisconsin. Todd Schmidt says when he was growing up, kids could play outside, go to a neighbor's house, all without worrying about the possibility of a terror attack. Now it's, it's spread out, you know what I'm saying, where it, it, it's here. I believe there's ISIS in America today. It's just we don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. They could just pop up at hospitals or bars like they did down in Florida or in California. It's a concern that might seem far from the minds of people here in Boscobel, Wisconsin. Americans, by one estimate, are five times more likely to be killed by a police officer than a foreign-born terrorist. And much of that violence is in cities. Yet those worries help push efforts to tighten U.S. borders. Much as we'd love to see more people come here because it is the greatest nation in the world, there's an apprehension there to say, you know, wait a minute, we need to vet these people, find out who they are, where they came from, and what their intent is. But unlike at the national level, Schmitz has no desire to see blanket bans. Just be a little more diligent about watching who comes in and out. I mean, majority of the people aren't here to kill me and my family or people, you know, Americans. He would be happy to see laws already in place to be better enforced. Deepak Dobhal, VOA News, Boscobel, Wisconsin. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, a newly identified fossil opens a window on unique African dinosaurs. We'll be right back. But the social media uh, blockade continues until the examination ends. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. If you're being treated for cancer, speak up about your symptoms. A study shows that patients using home computers to report problems like nausea and fatigue improved their survival rate by almost half a year. 
The online tool was intended as a quick and easy way for people to regularly report symptoms rather than trying to call their doctors or waiting until their next appointment. Doctors hoped the questionnaire would improve the patient's quality of life, but it also showed an improved survival rate. Median survival in the online group was 31 months versus 26 months uh, for the others. Well, next up, donor delivery by drone could be a sign of how takeaways might be dropped off in the future. In the western U.S. state of Colorado, Denver's mayor, cops and firefighters have been the first beneficiaries of donuts by drone. Lammers Donuts in the city used a drone to deliver four boxes of donuts using piloted drones flown from parking lots within a block of the delivery target. Federal Aviation Administration officials said they were investigating to ensure the deliveries followed federal rules governing commercial drones used in a populated area. The FAA has rules that govern drone altitude, proximity to airports, and flying over people who are not part of the crew flying the drone. Now, what's the best way to burn off those donut uh, calories that may have been taken in? Maybe climbing this augmented reality wall in Finland could get you in shape. It's not any old climbing wall. Regular surfaces have been turned into giant gaming touchscreens. The Finnish developers behind the tech, high, the high-tech creation, claim it attracts new audiences to climbing while encouraging game adult children to get active. The technology works by using a depth camera to track the climber's movement and a projector to display the various animations. And that is what is trending today. Now, a fossil of the last dinosaurs living in, a, in Africa before the extinction 66 million years ago has been discovered in Morocco. Faith Lapidus has details. This fossilized jawbone belonged to this dinosaur. Shinanosaurus barbaricus was found at a phosphate mine in Morocco. Paleontologist Nick Longrich at the University of Bath identified the new species. He says it indicates Africa had its own dinosaurs until an asteroid hit 66 million years ago, wiping out the dinosaurs and marking the end of the Cretaceous period. We have a pretty good picture of the dinosaurs from North America for this time period. For example, Triceratops and T-Rex are part of the, this fauna, uh, this sort of twilight fauna, the last dinosaurs on Earth. But we don't have a good picture of what's going on in the rest of the world. And we know almost nothing about the African dinosaurs from this time period. This African predator was smaller than T. rex and different in other ways, too. They have a much shorter, blunter snout. The arms are actually shorter than those of a T. rex. And whereas T. rex is very bird-like and would have been feathered, these things were scaly. And T. rex wasn't particularly intelligent. But this thing was like, had a smaller brain than even a T-Rex did. So it's a, in many ways a much more primitive dinosaur. But Shinanosaurus was still a powerful predator. The tooth structure, <clears throat> these large serrations, the tooth is compressed side to side, and that's typical of the dinosaurs. That's how you know it's a dinosaur. For Longrich, the fossils found at the Moroccan mines help confirm the theory of a mass extinction of a thriving ecosystem. But it's interesting to see evidence confirming that dinosaurs remain successful and the fauna stayed pretty stable up until the end of the Cretaceous period in Africa. So I think there's no evidence, as far as I'm concerned, of a decline in dinosaur diversity approaching the extinction. And if it hadn't been for this asteroid, we'd probably still have dinosaurs here today. But then the age of mammals might never have dawned. I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. And that's our show for today. Have a good night. Thanks for watching. Welcome to English in a Minute. Today's episode won't cost you anything. Freebie. Let's see what this one is about. Anna, I love my job. Oh yeah? Why is that? I get so many freebies from the bands I write about. CDs, t-shirts, water bottles, even tickets to see them perform. Wow. The only freebie I ever got from my 